One of the things that drew me to being part of this program is the tissue paper thin uh, uh, distance between people that are working in agriculture in different areas. So the people that are working in it from a production side, the veterinarians who are trying to help them, as well as the academic researchers and other research maybe from industry. So uh, there are so many uh, scientists in this small community, it would surprise you. All of that focused right up here in the Panhandle. This is a very special place to be. The two projects we have ongoing right now where how the microbiome relates to the, the health of, the, of young animals. Um, if we look at highly related horses as a model for that, we can look at cloned horses, so they are absolutely identical to full siblings, to half siblings, to unrelated horses, and we can look at whether or not um, that their genetic relatedness has an impact on what their microbiome structure. We were doing a project with uh, estradiol sulpra drug combination to make mares cycle in the winter time when they're in an estrus. So it was a really exciting project, really industry leading. Equine health is more my focus. However, I have done some uh, studies with calves, dairy calves specifically. And for me, it just is going to help us understand more of how some diseases develop in animals that we don't necessarily always understand, and maybe the microbiome is linked to that. There are a lot of opportunities for students and non-students to be part of research efforts, and it would really give you a, a first-hand taste of whether or not that is exciting to you. I didn't know that I wanted to be a researcher, but uh, took advantage of a number of programs which allowed students to have initial exposures into research, and that's what led me to my career today. The Ogallala Aquifer Program has started in 2003, and since then I have been part of that program. For these top 26 counties in the Texas Panhandle, we are pumping 2.98, almost 3 million acre feet of water to irrigate our crops. By 2070, we will be pumping 2 million acre feet. So over 50 years, the reduction will be 31%, almost one third. That's what our main focus is, how we can have more crop per drop and how we can extend the life of Ogallala Aquifer to sustain the regional economy. One of the projects that we just wrapped up was uh, what we call the Ogallala CAT project, which is the Ogallala Coordinated Agricultural Project. Um, and this was a $10 million grant that we had in coordination um, with Colorado State University. It has created relationships and networking because what's interesting about water research is our water policy in the United States is different if you're in Texas, if you're in Kansas, if you're in Colorado. So not only do you have access to different water resources, where that, whether that be surface water or groundwater, how that water is regulated is vastly different. It was the first project of its kind to include all of the states that are over the Ogallala Aquifer. Last year, we were lucky to have another project from USDA NEFA, and its title is Texas Farm Business Management and Benchmarking Education and Outreach Alliance. It will provide agriculture producers with professional consulting services for farm financial management. So we are going to, uh, with our knowledge, we are going to go to the producers. Many producers, especially under COVID, they were struggling. Of course, they have some help from the government, but still they need service or advice to improve their financial feasibility of their farms in Texas Panhandle. Since joining the faculty, it has been a wonderful opportunity to collaborate with Dr. Guerrero and Dr. Almas on the Oglala Aquifer Program projects. I love challenging graduate students to that higher level of thinking. They take that knowledge that was the foundation in their undergraduate, and then they're able to build on that. Some of them, when they started, may not have even known uh, that the Ogallala Aquifer existed. Also, we've had some that have maybe a strong livestock background but don't know a lot about crops. For them to also learn a different aspect of our industry, I think has been crucially important in helping to transfer that knowledge to the next uh, set of researchers. Go Buffs.
Plate tectonics is the overall unifying theory of the Earth that explains how rocks form and, and move and change. And uh, so the specific thing that I'm interested in with plate tectonics is, um, is, is what processes cause the continental crust to form and grow and change through time. Uh, so a large part of what our field work entails is uh, geologic mapping, which is basically just describing all of the rocks at the surface of the Earth, but not only what kind of rocks they are, but how they're positioned, because their orientation can tell us about how they've changed and moved throughout space and time. Uh, what I really love about my research is that it's uh, it's a I really like puzzles, and studying geology and plate tectonics is the biggest puzzle you can possibly study. It allows me to combine lots of different um, skills and disciplines in a really interesting and engaging way. I was attracted to uh, WT because I wanted the opportunity to, to teach undergraduates specifically. So I'm very, very passionate about um, telling people about, about geology and geoscience. The thing that's really exciting about involving you know, research in your, in your teaching is that all too often uh, it can feel in a, in a classroom like you're you're just learning this uh, this body of knowledge that is uh, stagnant, you know, that just exists. It's, this is what we know, uh, but what research is 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 pushing the envelope and and discovering new things. Students become uh, more interested when they realize that there's a real genuine question that you're trying to answer, uh, and then they want to be able to help contribute to finding the answer to that question, and that forces them to learn. So I'm always trying to include students in my research, both in the field and in the laboratory. So I often try to bring students out to be a part of the field work, be a part of the sample collection uh, out in the field, and then take students to uh, the labs where I do my analytical work. So I've taken students to the University of Arizona, to Texas Tech, and hopefully we'll be going also to New Mexico Tech uh, this year as well. Material science is foundational for any type of engineering. We started doing that work here on campus at WT in 2009, and that work has expanded. Now we've commercialized it, so we could use this in everyday life. Like we could use this to help our neighbors or our community or our country. And so we started to commercialize those products here at WT. And then for this project specifically, we're working at preventing corrosion that is uh, specifically on mooring chains that hold offshore drilling rigs and production rigs on site. So uh, we're talking very thick, uh, heavy duty chains that uh, go all the, all the way to the bottom of the ocean. And we're working on the coatings that protect those chains from the microbes in the water. Um, once we have determined what coating we want to use and how we want to try to keep the bacteria from eating through those steel chains, we, we need to test that. And so, you know, we don't live near an ocean. So a lot of that testing is done um, in our labs using equipment that we have here on campus. We have so much fun with this because uh, from an engineering perspective, everything is a new problem to solve. So we started with these materials that were resistant against, like I said, harmful microbes. We had several projects where we were successful in using them in oil and gas, both downhole, offshore. Even if you think about ships and the biofilm that builds up on ships and, and fouling is what they call it, when you actually have live ocean organisms that attach to a structure in the water. We, so we started to develop materials that could protect against that, basically keep the marine life from being able to attach to a coating. One of the things that's unique about coming to a smaller research institution is that you have the opportunity to really dive into undergraduate research early in your career. I think uh, personally, there's no way I would have gotten to do the research I got to do at WT at a large university. We've got one of the most innovative and interactive engineering programs in the country, and that's been intentional. That's been great work by our administrators, by Dr. Hunt, Dr. Spaulding. Come try it out. I highly recommend it. The Department of Communication Disorders here at West Texas A&M were training future speech language pathologists to fill the need in our profession, not just here in the Panhandle, but also in the United States. There is a shortage of speech language pathologists. For this particular research project, I recruited mothers and their children, and I recorded them playing for 15 minutes. And then we um, transcribed those play sessions. And so that's where the graduate students came in. They helped me transcribe all those interactions that the mothers and children 
and their children did. And then we've coded them for different behaviors and for different things that they've said and different movements that they've made to really study more about how they play with their child, how they talk to their child, and how they establish joint attention with their children. What I found in my research initially is that when um, mothers and their language delayed children interact, moms don't get to be responsive. Moms have to take on the role of leading those interactions. And so they don't necessarily get to expand. They're always leading and perpetuating and trying to keep the interaction going to try and get their child to talk to them. We know that typically developing children have pretty good joint attention skills, but this population of children with language delays, it's kind of gray. There's a gap in that research. We don't know if their joint attention skills are like typically developing children, which hypothetically they should be, or if they're more like children with autism who have um, gaps in their joint attention skills. So really my research, my goal is to fill that gap of what does joint attention look like for children with language delays? I received a faculty development grant to help me purchase video recording equipment and some tests that I needed and um, to help me hire a graduate assistant to do some of the data analysis. I was attracted to WT because of the regional nature and also because of the high proportion of first generation students at this campus. I felt that I would be perfect to teach the first generation. And additionally, when I was hired, they said 25% of students were Hispanic or Latino. And that was a major factor in deciding to work here. And also, this campus allows me to teach the courses I enjoy, which is business statistics and a medley of business communication courses. I think social science is important because it can impact people. And when we think about people, we are so highly complex and no individual is exactly like any other. By obtaining their social scientific perceptions, we are better able to see a little bit of the general trends in their attitudes, general trends in their feelings, general trends in their behaviors. And that I believe is valuable. The first one is on a business communication and compassion project. And I was interested in looking at positive variables such as compassion and mindfulness. The higher their self-compassion and mindfulness, that the better they communicate, but also it increases their job satisfaction. The second project, which is intertwined with the third, I looked at the COVID-19 pandemic and its effects on faculty and students. One thing that happened during the pandemic was that faculty had to transition to teaching to use and utilize video teleconferencing technologies such as Zoom, WebEx, Smart Teams. What I found was that some faculty were comparing themselves to others who were more skillful or perceived to be better than them. And the people that did that, they actually had increased burnout and they also had increased teaching anxiety, and reduce teaching satisfaction. One implication of that project is that it's okay to compare yourself to others who are perceived to be more skillful or have a higher status, but approach it from a self-improvement perspective and not as a comparing of abilities because otherwise it harms the faculty's well-being. My research specifically looks at the phenomenon known as vocal fatigue, which clinically we know as a tired voice, but empirically and from a research standpoint, we debate the definition for what that term really means. And so if we want to prevent voice disorders, we need to be able to identify one of the first symptoms of a voice disorder, which includes vocal fatigue. There's a model of healthcare known as a life participation approach, which really means we can treat symptoms all we want to, and maybe those symptoms get better, but if the ultimate outcome of being able to do what we want to do in life, say uh, an elderly woman can't talk to her grandson on the telephone. That's what we need to be focusing on. And so what I think is important about my research here at WT as well as a scholar is that I, I hope that it contributes to this growing trend of 
Um, we need to make sure that we involve our patients in not only using these tools in clinical practice, but also that they are part of the development process as well. This clinic right now is the new um, WT Speech and Hearing Clinic, and in this room that we're in specifically is the Voice and Swallowing Lab. Uh, we are very fortunate that a university our size has the means to have the equipment that we have. We have state-of-the-art, um, flexible, endoscopy, which helps us assess swallowing, as well as with stroboscopy allows us to look at the vocal folds and determine the degree that maybe the vocal folds aren't moving quite as well. We also have rigid stroboscopy. In addition, we have a comprehensive laryngeal function lab, which includes um, a K-Pentax a uh, computerized speech lab VisiPitch that helps us acquire acoustic measurements. And then we also have a phonatory aerodynamic system which helps us measure the types of airflow that are necessary to set those vocal folds in motion for communication. We have a very supportive dean, Dr. Dean Nelson, in the College of Nursing and Health Sciences, as well as uh, Dr. Spalding in the graduate school. There's been more, not just um, financial support, but there's also been this moral support of, yes, this is important and you need to keep at it and keep doing it. So I would say that just the camaraderie that I've received at WT, of course, uh, when you have to talk money, if you can show that there's a plan, they're a little bit more ready to, to help you out with the money part. And then again, understanding that especially as a healthcare professional who is now also a researcher and educator, when patient outcomes meet student outcomes, that's really what we need to be about. The hard part comes to, okay, now what can I contribute? It's identifying those gaps. And so that can be the hardest part is saying what other people have said it is, is the easy part, really finding where you fit into the puzzle. Um, it is really um, a challenging but a savory moment um, to have if you're willing to engage in that journey. So the mural project originally started with a Kilgore grant in 2014 uh, to found what we call the WT Mural Squad, where we went to Dalhart, Texas and painted a large mural on the back of the Lorita Theater. Um, that grant allowed us to continue our mural projects, and since then we've done over 20 murals all over the Texas Panhandle, um, some led by me as the faculty and some student-led. We are in the Panhandle Plains Historical Museum, and the mural behind us is actually the first mural of the Rural Mural Project. Um, this mural is based on a painting here in the museum, and it has the, I the idea that they gave me when they approached me about the mural was, who we are. The research I do is about public art. And again, the first mural grant was to buy materials and equipment to fund and do logistics on murals, how much they cost, what kind of equipment you need, how many workers you need, how long they take, how much paint you need. Um, and then the second one was to train students and hire students to help video document the mural process. Um, the research in itself is about public art and the benefit of how to make murals accessible to everyone. I think students learn professional responsibility, they learn logistics, I teach them the budgeting, I teach them the planning on how these things take so they could actually go out and do murals on their own. And murals are much more about social engagement. When we were in Stratford painting one of the rural murals we just did, I think the entire town came out to talk to us. Um, and so it was very exciting for the students to kind of be these kind of stars for a little bit. And so they got to see the tangible reality of the benefit of art on a community. I think that it helps people realize that there's more to research than just science the research. I love science. I think science is very important. I like math, but I think social science specifically is about social engagement. Um, and I may be speaking because it's in my career field, but I think this type of stuff proves that art has a role in social sciences and it affects the public in a unique way. The common theme to all my research is that employees uh, are larger than their jobs. Um, it's really important. Uh, even, from a, even from the most selfish organizational perspective, they want their employees to be engaged and happy. Uh, even if they don't really truly care about employees, they still care about their profits and profits are higher when employees are engaged. So, so it's a win-win when organizations and managers treat their employees with respect and when employees have the bandwidth to, to be engaged in their jobs. So my, my dissertation is based and oriented around positive event disclosures at work. The ratio of positive to negative workplace events is three to one, uh, even if the negative events are more impactful compared to the one to one. And employees are motivated to capitalize on these positive events even after they've sunsetted or transpired. So even later on, they will 
tell and share their positive events with their coworkers. That not only has implications for that focal employee, but for their coworkers who are the targets of these disclosures. Coworkers are either inspired or become envious when they hear their coworkers share good news. As a function of competition, when there's more competition in the workplace, these positive event disclosures elicit envy, which motivates social undermining behaviors. But on the, the positive side of the coin, when competition is lower, when, when I hear my coworker share good news with me, I'm inspired to achieve the same, and that motivates uh, citizenship behaviors in me. One of my research ideas that was accepted for publication looks at how physical activity can shield us from bad bosses. The, the implication there being that employees, especially if they're working for a, a toxic boss, is to find opportunities to go on a walk in the afternoon or, or commute to work via bicycle or, or foot uh, or exercise before or after work. And, and you're, you'll be able to uh, maintain and sustain your cognitive resources and be less harmed when your, your boss goes on tirades. Uh, and so my research really is uh, at its core, promoting um, uh, fair work-life balance, promoting uh, employees taking care of themselves um, and, and finding engagement in their work. The research that was done by Dr. Ferguson and others in the field of early childhood education um, reiterates that about 80% of brain growth happens from birth to age three. And so we really need to make an impact and influence students' growth and development early on. And so that is sort of the impetus behind the research and behind the intervention that we are will be rolling out in the next few years. And so I think the most important thing that's going to come out of this research is we'll be able to tell families, hey, here's what your child needs to be doing at this age. Here's why reading to your child is so important. Here's how you can read to your child. Here's what you can do with your child to ensure that they're ready when they go to kindergarten. We want to collect data to see what our parents in Potter County really know about early childhood development and about the resources that are available to them in the community. This research study is going to collect baseline data to see where we are right now. And then as we roll out the interventions throughout the community, we will be sampling other data along the way. We don't know exactly when that will occur, but probably you know at two and five years to see how we're doing later on. So this is a long-term project. Both of our deans have been fully behind us as far as what resources can we help you with? And then just allowing us the time to work together to build those relationships and, and um, connecting us with other people at WT that might be able to help us. I think making those connections into the community are very important. Uh, we also receive a lot of donor support through um, so many philanthropists. The uh, Emerald Area Foundation is also involved in this uh, work. And so you can see that it just has lots of tentacles into the community. So be open to all those opportunities when they come your way.